Hey guys, the video you're watching right now is a production from The Remnant Radio. You'll notice uh, uh, myself, Michael Roundtree, and Michael Miller are not the co-host of this program on Tuesdays. On Tuesdays, we are covering church history. Here on Remnant Radio, we want to cover theology, church history, and the gifts of the Spirit. But none of us are patristic scholars, but we know some. Uh, in fact, the scholars that we interview frequently on church history, we have empowered to make weekly content here on Remnant Radio. So for the next 12 weeks, Josh Hoffert, Father Ron Drummond, and Matthew Escobar are going to be your guides through the early church fathers as they tackle this patristic period of history uh, that we are calling Back to the Fathers. And uh, speaking of Father Ron Drummond, he wears that clerical collar he every does. single week. And I think he needs something new. Yeah. We are he entirely crowdfunded. And if you donate to the Remnant Radio, perhaps we could afford to Another provide shirt. Father Ron Drummond with a new shirt. Solid. So uh, that is speaking of us being a crowdfunded ministry. We are. I want to invite you to uh, to contribute. If you've benefited in any way from Remnant Radio's content, uh, two ways that you can do that. You can click on the link for PayPal or Patreon. PayPal is for a one-time donation. Patreon is for a recurring donation once a month for as little as $5 a month. And we provide you with exclusive content that Josh and I come up with as well as uh, some of our other contributors. So I want to invite you guys to do that. Consider donating. And now stay tuned for Back to the Fathers. Welcome, everybody, to the Remnant Radio and Back to the Fathers. This is episode number 10. You may notice that I've uh, got a little bit of a different background here. I'm uh, on the road uh, hanging out with some friends out in Western Canada, and uh, so not in my office, but... Uh, excited to be back, and as you may have noticed last week, both Father Ron and myself were missing from the uh, from the podcast. But uh, Matthew, of course, uh, he took over and did an excellent job um, talking about Maximus Conf not Maximus the Confessor, uh, uh, Dionysius Areopagite. So you know, uh, I'm just loving these conversations. I'm looking forward to tonight. And um, again, welcome. This is our this is our tenth episode. And we are in for a theological fight night where we cover some of the early arguments that were going on, the debates and the back and forths. And, uh, you know, while it may not be as quite as entertaining as the time uh, Santa punched a heretic, um, but, uh, but uh, here we're going to talk about uh, the, the, early Gnostic, uh, the early Gnostic battle in Christian history. And so I'm looking forward to this and uh, seeing where this takes us. So Matthew Esquivel, Esquivel, I'm going to get that right. Esquivel, one Esquivel. 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 There you go. Esquivel. Yes. 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 <laughs> so what, what do we got going on? Emphasis, and, emphasis yes. on the very last level. So. <laughs> yes. um, awesome. Yeah, well, let's talk about what we have coming up. We've been doing a run this month and back to the fathers on the sacramental worldview of the fathers. And that entails how the fathers understood the relationship between the spiritual realm and the material realm. And so, um, as Josh Hoffert mentioned, Father Ron's going to lead us today is uh, Irenaeus battled against the, the, the Gnostics. Um, but in these uh, upcoming weeks, uh, join us next week. It's going to be real exciting. Josh Hoffert is going to, speaking of the, the spiritual material, material realm, is going to be talking about some of the miraculous claims in the early fathers and some of these, the views of the desert fathers on demons. So if you have this really morbid curiosity in the demonic or in miracles or both, um, next week is the episode for you. And then we're going to close out, which is a little sad, um, as far at least for this this uh, this run, we finished episode twelve. We're going to look more at a modern view of the sacramental theology, and so. Um, but tune in now, Father Ron, as he talks to us about Irenaeus and the Gnostics. So, Father Ron, what's going on with this guy Irenaeus, and who are these Gnostics that we're going to talk about? Good question. I'm so glad you asked. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's like so, it leads right into what you were going to talk about. <laughs> amazing, amazing. So, yeah, uh, this is a theological fight night. So we're going to be addressing a uh, very specific dispute, a very specific controversy in the early church. And we're kind of going to be rewinding the clock quite a bit. You know, we've, we've talked about a number of the ecumenical councils and the theological disputes that uh, gave rise to those councils. Uh, the... 
the period and the figures that we're going to cover today uh, actually go back even before the first ecumenical council. And so we're going to discuss the dispute between uh, Irenaeus and uh, the Gnostics, at least uh, certain Gnostic teachers of the second century. So the first question to ask really is, what is Gnosticism? When we talk about Gnosticism, uh, what, what do we mean by that? So uh, the word Gnostic, Gnosticism, uh, that is derived from the Greek word gnosis, and that uh, word means knowledge. And it's sort of a blanket term given to a, uh, a pretty complex series of movements or trends of thought, uh, which in their Christian form came to prominence in the second century. And uh, we think that these uh, Gnostic Christian movements were actually rooted in forms of thought that were already present uh, in the pre-Christian era in pagan religious circles probably started out as a school or schools of thought within existing churches, and as uh, eventually they spread to just about every major Christian center of the early church. And by the end of the second century, they had broken off and become uh, independent sects of, of their own. Uh, what we find is that in some of the uh, later books of the New Testament, like the first epistle of John, the pastoral epistles, uh, first, second Timothy and Titus, uh, we can find refutations of forms of false teaching, which are similar to, but not as developed as uh, the Gnostic systems of thought that are mentioned by second century uh, Christian writers like Irenaeus, who right. we'll talk about tonight, or Tertullian. Matthew, we're going to so, say something? Yeah, Father, so I'm thinking First John, one, a couple of examples there, and maybe throw out others you had in mind. But, you know, uh, First John, he's dealing with this false teaching that the, the Son of God did not come in the flesh. He, he deals with that very specifically. It says says that anyone who denies the Son of God came in the flesh is the Antichrist, you know, which is a pretty intense statement. Um, but it's, that's kind of is that's kind of this an, a nascent form of, of how Gnosticism started infiltrating Christianity, that it it denied that the Son of God became flesh. Um, is uh, um, we've talked about Docetism before, but um, um, are there and I don't know if there are any other examples that you thought of. That, uh, that would be exactly where I would go, is the sort of okay. docetic heresy that, uh, okay. that the, 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 you know, Christ didn't come in the flesh. Uh, the Word of God was not, in fact, uh, made flesh and, and dwelt among us. Um, I think John would agree with one of our commenters, uh, Dustin Neely, who's uh, one of our Eastern Orthodox brothers, who says, just say no to doc docetism. Uh, and... <laughs> I, I think the Apostle John and, and Irenaeus, and uh, certainly we all agree with that as well. Um, but right. uh, to your point, uh, Josh Hoffert, were you going to jump in? Yeah, well, I was just, I'm just thinking um, the, the, Gnostic, the, the Gnostic impetus to, to really understand started hundreds and hundreds of years before the New Testament, because you've got, you have, um, obviously you don't have the, the form that they took ultimately when Irenaeus, or Irenaeus is arguing or presenting against heresies. But I mean, these things were well seated within Greek thought and within the culture, within the pagan religions, mm -hmm. these types of ideas. Um, you can, I mean, you go back to some of the, the, uh, the mythological framework around Zeus and the, the Titans and this kind of stuff and how the whole, the whole clashing of those things is what create it was what gave mankind the divine spark and created mankind you know i don't remember all the details about it but it i mean it goes back hundreds of years before this and it really presents a a paradigm in in the sense of a worldview that's very different than the biblical worldview and i say that to say that you know we, we, we've had this thread of thought in our contemporary age where um you get you get this idea that well jesus was just an amalgamation of all of these, you know, pagan religious thoughts and all of this. And, 
And so, you know, and, and, and this has kind of been pulled into our modern world where they go, well, look, the Egyptian thought here, the Greek thought here, this just makes up the culmination of who Jesus was. They just borrowed all kinds of different thoughts and created something. But to that point, they were arguing against those things and showing very, very early on and showing how, no, actually, what we're saying about Jesus is distinctly different than what you were saying mm -hmm. here. And, and so it, right. it does bear to say that this is actually a really big part of Christian development that people have kind of co-opted today and said, well, look at you know, all these her or all these Gnostic ideas. That just means that Jesus isn't real. Right, right. And of course, uh, that's one of the things that Irenaeus himself right there in the second century will tackle uh, is that uh, no, Jesus is not just an amalgam of, of all these different forms of thought, all these mythical characters, things like that. Uh, one of the problems with Gnosticism, though, is that there are just so many different forms of it. Right. Uh, we use that term as sort of a term of convenience, as a blanket term to cover all kinds of things. And the interesting thing about the early Christian period, uh, and even slightly before, is that there are uh, both Hellenistic uh, or, or Greek forms of Gnosticism, but there were also some Judaizing Gnostic uh, tendencies and movements as well. Um, and so what I want to do is just sort of sketch out sort of the broad points uh, that are common to uh, most of, of these Gnostic thoughts. So first of all, I, I, oh, go ahead. One thing, Father Ron, before you do, is we're, st and, and this is the same with all the heresies that we've been addressing, we're starting to see some of these thoughts crop back up in our modern culture. And, um, you know, it's, it's been said in the last 50 years or so that the, the, the co contemporary American um, religion, the religion of America is Gnosticism. Um, and this whole idea of discovering your, your inner spark or your inner divinity and, you know, this kind of stuff is starting to crop up today again. And so, even as Ron's going through defining some of these things, think through, you know, maybe I've heard some of these kind of thoughts before. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll get, you know, we'll get there towards the end. But uh, I would also argue that there's elements of Gnostic thought that has even infiltrated otherwise um, biblically minded churches, right. uh, if not mm -hmm. the ex if not in explicit theological concepts, in in a worldview. Uh, in a general worldview that bears more of a resemblance uh, to Gnosticism than to Scripture or, or the early Christian fathers. So, but, so everybody, stay tuned for the real controversial part when <laughs> Father Ron starts to tear down the religious institutions you love so dearly. <laughs> I came here to play. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So uh, the, I think the first point that I would make uh, in sketching out Gnostic thought is that uh, most Gnostic teaching was thoroughly duist, uh, dualistic. And what I mean by dualistic is that uh, it sets an infinite chasm between the spiritual world and the material creation. Uh, never the twain shall meet. There's no bridging the two. There's no need to because the material world is at best inferior and at worst intrinsically evil. Uh, that's something that you find throughout uh, Gnostic teaching. And, and because of that, the Gnostics were pretty dismissive of uh, not only the material creation, but uh, of history. Um, historical processes, historical developments, they don't really matter because, uh, well, matter doesn't matter. Um, and uh, in most Gnostic thinking, there's a distinction between the supreme and remote and unknowable God, right? The supreme divine being and an inferior being called the demiurge, right? Uh, it's kind of a cool word, but a really bad concept. <laughs> the, the demiurge uh, is uh, derived from the supreme divine being by a shorter or longer series of, of emanations or uh, eons, as they're called, you know, divine mediators, angels, spiritual beings, whatever you want to call it. But there's this sort of like chain of being, this hierarchy from the supreme unknowable God down to this demiurge. And it's the demiurge who is the creator of the material order, uh, not the true God of, of light and of goodness. And so the material creation, in the words of the patristic scholar J.N.D. Kelly, 
uh, was the product of some primeval disorder or some conflict or fall mm -hmm. in the higher realm. So again, uh, depending on which teacher you're talking about, the, the material creation uh, is either a, a, a tragic bumbling mistake um, or it's just a, an outright uh, evil thing that gets in the way of salvation. It gets in the way <laughs> of, of redemption. Right. Right. It makes me think of just uh, ancient Babylonian and even, and even Persian myths of the of uh, of their cosmology of their 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 story of creation. I mean, and and in Babylon, uh, Babylonian myth, the uh, creation, if I'm not mistaken, was the result of a battle between Marduk and Tiamat, right. <laughs> and Marduk wins. And and I mean, this sounds pretty graphic, but that's 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 Babylonian culture for you. It's like the remain the Tiamat's like dismembered, and her remains are what become the material creation. Um, and so it's just interesting that Gnosticism, it, it has these deep roots, you know, and similarities to, um, to ancient pagan religions. Um, and then we see it creeping in as, as, as your, as Father Ron, as you talked about it, we, Irenaeus is worried about how it's creeping into the, to the Christian church. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and it was an elitist, uh, spirituality or spiritualities in the plural, uh, much of the, the Gnostic thinking held that there were three types of people in the world. There were carnal people, there were uh, psychical or animal or soulish, depending on which word you're using, and then there were the spiritual, right? The only people who could be saved were the spiritual people, the pneumatic people. Those were the ones that had a divine spark inside, right? Josh Hoffert mentioned this whole divine spark, right? Oh, so, so it's just like reformed theology. Is... Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> those are, those, those, that's a fight night word. That's a... Shots <laughs> fired. <laughs> Shots. Lobbing the grenades. <laughs> Shot. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to wait for the comment section to blow up yeah. uh, as a result yeah, of that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, you're going to, you you have to deal with any issues that raise that, that right, cost, right. sir. <laughs> we'll refer uh, any and all comments to Josh Hofford for, for that. Uh. Mm -hmm. But the, you know, these pneumatic people, the spiritual people, they are the ones who have the divine spark within them and they have this longing within them to be freed from the material realm, right? Their, their physical bodies and the material realm itself. These are prisons from which these spiritual people long to be freed. And this is accomplished through gnosis, right? That's where the term Gnostic comes from. Gnosis is just the Greek word for knowledge, but, but knowledge in this Gnostic sense is a secret knowledge that is only given to the initiates, that's only given to uh, the elite, and it's that knowledge which frees the pneumatics, the spirituals, uh, from the prison of the body and the material order altogether. Um, another aspect or feature of Gnostic thought is that it is filled with elaborate genealogies, uh, hierarchies of various divine beings or eons, uh, angels, and all kinds of different ranks of angels, and, and various mediators between the supreme divine being uh, and and the horrible, horrible material order. Uh, so, Ron, yeah, Ron, I wonder if um, just a, if we can get a small comment, maybe from uh, Matt Matthew from last week, because. You covered the divine hierarchies, right? What's the di what's mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. in, in just a in just a nutshell? Because that sounds similar, but it's not similar at all. So, so what might be the difference be when we're looking at Dionysius and what he's talking about in terms of our ascent to knowing God versus what some of the Gnostic thought is? Right. Well, so if you tuned in last week, we talked about uh, Dionysius the Areopagite and his. Uh, his theology of this, what he called the celestial hierarchy and the ecclesial hierarchy. So you've got a heavenly hierarchy and you've got an earthly or church hierarchy. Um, and for, for Dionysius, I mean, the biggest difference is he's going to maintain that there is one creator God and that God has created all of the angelic beings and that celestial order, that heavenly hierarchy of angelic beings that, uh, um, and that, um, and that he is the creator of the ecclesial order. He's the creator of all human beings. So in Gnosticism, as Father Ron was talking about, you have this 
demiurge and these emanations of of these different eons that um, in themselves start emanating <laughs> and begetting other beings. And so you have um, really the the unknowable, incomprehensible God in Gnosticism, um, and is is a separate creating is a separate principle than the demiurge, the creator, and and it and and so you got you. you you got a totally different creator going on, and then you have um, the gods begetting or the eons begetting other eons, and so it's. I mean, I I, uh, I actually I took some notes for a class I did a while ago on book one of Irenaeus is against heresies. So some of the Valentinian cosmology, I mean, it is just literally out of this world. You've got a pre-existent <laughs> eon, you got with him a female, a Noah, and they all have like three or four names, so it's really hard to keep track of. And then so and so begat so and so 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 begot Noose and begot Logos and Zoe and Zoe emanated ten other eons. I mean, it just and it and it goes on and on. You have like these different orders, and so that's not what Dionysius is doing at all. <laughs> Dionysius yes. is, is saying that God has put in a a heavenly hierarchy, a celestial one and an earthly one, a, an ecclesial one in the church, and the, He's created all of them. And the purpose is that um, each each level within that hierarchy is to bring people in, bring the, the the next rank below them into a greater understanding and revelation of God, into divination, into it, not divination, divinization, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, into godlikeness. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, we talked all about all that last week. So tune in if you want to. So one is the, the hierarchy in, in Dionysius reveals God. The hierarchy in Gnosticism obscures God. The further away you get, he's, he's super knowable, so we need all these emanations. God's not becoming right. knowable through these things. Right, right. And in more Christianity, and more exactly. In Christianity, God, God is unknowable to the human intellect in the sense that he's beyond what we can understand, but he is, he makes himself known to us. And Dionysius is really clear on that. He makes himself known to us in the scriptures. He makes us known to him in his son, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so Father Ron, going back, you you had some of these teachers, and Matt had just referenced some of them that were that had these these strange systems. Well, who were some of these guys? Oh goodness! Well, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, we, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Irenaeus's primary work uh, in which he does battle with these various teachers. And like Matthew said, book one of uh, Irenaeus against the heresies uh, is just a mind boggler to read because of, of uh, all these teachers. But you have, uh, again, you, you've got Gnostic teachers from various centers of Christianity. So you, you have uh, Saturninus, uh, who comes out of, of Antioch, you have uh, Valentinus. Now, Valentinus uh, taught the form of Gnosticism that was the most popular and influential at the time of Irenaeus. Uh, but Valentinus uh, most likely came from Egypt, and so you had a Gnostic base there. Uh, Marcion. Now, Marcion is uh, sort of Gnostic-like. He's quasi-Gnostic. Uh, Irenaeus interacts with him and refutes him, uh, but Marcion is much closer to to the to the church than some of these other teachers who were already uh, mm -hmm. se sectarians at the time. But Marcion, of course, is from Pontus. So uh, all these different teachers come from different centers of, of Christianity. But Irenaeus uh, does, does most of his interaction with the teaching of Valentinus, um, and, and he spends quite a bit of time... Uh, Valentinus just carries on the teaching of another uh, Gnostic teacher named Basilides, and uh, Basilides has a pretty interesting you know, cosmology and, and, and view of things. Sometimes you read these things, you're like, what did these guys do for their day job? I mean, it's like they spent their, <laughs> their whole time creating these these elaborate myths that are very difficult to follow. But right. anyway. They sound, like, they sound like dungeon masters in Dungeons and Dragons. So. Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> so, so, Father Ron, tell us about Irenaeus. Well, who was Irenaeus? Well, for, just first off the bat, uh, Irenaeus has an interesting name because his name comes from the Greek word for peace uh, or peacefulness. Mm. 
And of course, his five books against the heresies are uh, just a theological carpet bombing of, uh, of Gnosticism. And, uh, but at any rate, that's his name, Irenaeus. Uh, he was born around the year 130 and is most likely born in Smyrna, which, of course, uh, we recognize as one of the, uh, one of the seven churches uh, mentioned in the book of, of Revelation. And being from Smyrna as a boy, he would have heard the bishop of the church there in Smyrna named Polycarp. Uh, and you can read uh, about Polycarp, and uh, especially his, his martyrdom uh, at a venerable old age. But Polycarp was the bishop of Smyrna and also believed to be a disciple of the apostle John. So Irenaeus serves as an important link between the New Testament era and the early Christian period. Irenaeus studied uh, in Rome, and undoubtedly he would have studied the works of Justin Martyr while he was in Rome, and he later became a presbyter or a priest uh, in the church in Lyon, which was in in Gaul or or France. Uh, He was sent back to Rome to mediate uh, a, a dispute between the Pope at the time and the church in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, over the date of celebrating. Uh, Easter. And while he was away from Lyon, there was a persecution, uh, a fierce persecution in Lyon, and the bishop at the time, Bishop Pothinus, was killed. And so when Irenaeus returned to Lyon, he succeeded to the see. He became the bishop of, of Lyon. And so there are two major works of Irenaeus's that are known to us today. The one that we're going to spend time talking about today is called uh, Adversus Heresies, uh, or Against the Heresies, five books uh, against the heresies. But he also wrote another work called The Demonstration of the the Apostolic Preaching. And The Demonstration of the Apostolic Preaching is uh, less a polemical work and more of a... uh, uh, Oh, I need to to reconnect. I'm, I'm not on. Oh, okay. So getting to the meat of the matter, uh, I think we're back, hopefully we're back, uh, getting to the, the real meat of the discussion today, um, we're going to talk about Irenaeus' refutation of Gnosticism and his defense of apostolic Christianity. And the work that uh, most fully addresses that is his work uh In the manuscripts, it's called The Five Books Against the Heresies. But Irenaeus' own title of the work, which I think is better, is The Refutation and Overthrow of Knowledge Falsely So-Called. Knowledge is just, again, uh, in the Greek, it's it's the word gnosis. But before we dive into that, uh, let's hear a message from our sponsor. Do you not know that you are God's temple, and that God's Spirit dwells in you? Now, if you were to read that in Greek, you would know that Paul is not saying that you individually are the temple, but that you plural, that you all, that you guys make up the temple in which God's Spirit dwells. Paul is making an appeal to the unity of church that we collectively make up the dwelling place of God's Spirit. This is one of many places in the New Testament where we really can miss something if we're just reading it in English. With Kairos Classroom, you can learn Greek. Join a real teacher and real classmates in a live online classroom and learn how to read and study the New Testament in its original language. Real learning happens in community. Sign up for a class right now. Okay, we're back. Um, Interestingly, while that was going on, a a comment came in that just mentioned, uh, are all these guys Catholics or just the priest? Um, So I'll give that a bit of a qualified answer uh, because it actually uh, ties in to Irenaeus and Irenaeus' lasting effect on the history of Christianity. Uh, None of us are Roman Catholics. Uh, I'm not a Roman Catholic priest. I'm an Mm -hmm. Anglican priest. Uh, however, I do consider myself Catholic in the broad sense. And what we'll find in Irenaeus, and really in the period of the early church, before there were so many divisions, uh, 
among Christians is that the opposite of the word Catholic back then was not Protestant. The opposite of the word Catholic was heretic. And so mm -hmm. looking for the Catholic teachers or the Catholic bishop or the Catholic church in an area uh, didn't mean, you know, find the one that has statues of Mary uh, and is under the Pope. It meant, what's the one that teaches the faith of the apostles? What's the one right. that continues the faith and practice right. of, of the apostles? So in that sense, uh, yeah, I guess you could say I'm, I'm a Catholic, but none of us are Roman Catholics, uh, just, to, just to throw that out there. So we're talking about the refutation and the overthrow of knowledge, falsely so-called. Irenaeus' is five books against the heresies. And uh, each book uh, kind of deals with a different aspect of this whole thing. And in his first book, he basically surveys the various Gnostic teachers and beliefs, right? So he's not going to refute something that he can't clearly articulate. Uh, and right off the bat, I think that's a valuable way to go about polemical debate uh, in theology is uh, so much of what marks Christian debate and argument today is uh, sides not knowing what the other is talking about. Irenaeus wants to make sure that he can articulate very clearly uh, what he's about to theologically carpet bomb. And so the first book is a survey of the leading Gnostic teachers and beliefs. And uh, in it, you know, he holds that the Gnostic teachers, they misinterpret scripture and they destroy the faith of a lot of folks under the pretense of superior knowledge. Uh, Irenaeus's goal is to demonstrate the absurdity and the even the internal inconsistency of Gnostic teaching. He exposes the flawed way in which they read Scripture, how they uh, rearrange it to uh, agree with their speculations. They read into Scripture rather than seek to draw out uh, what's there. And all of this includes their denial of the Incarnation, which we mentioned was already starting to appear in the New Testament era. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the maintenance of good works as a necessary part of salvation in the sense that we are called to live lives of Christian discipleship. Gnostics argue, uh, many of them argued, that uh, because they had this spirit, this spark, because they had this secret knowledge that saved them, that's all they needed. And so they could live their life in the flesh however they wanted. Uh, mm -hmm. And that would, uh, that would take forms of either extreme asceticism, where they abused their bodies, or extreme licentiousness, where they would indulge any of the lusts of the flesh they wanted, because it didn't matter. Right. So let's, let's get that clear there. So the, the, for the Gnostics, there's uh, this material, what happens to your material body has no bearing on, on your spirit, is basically what they're saying. So what, whatever actions... Um, there's such a such a divorce between spirit and matter here, um, and it's what's interesting is as you describe, Father, when you get two different extreme. One was people taking that to say, well, you know, the what I do in the physical in my material body doesn't affect my spirit, so I can engage in all forms of drunkenness or revelry, sexual immorality, and it has it doesn't change the fact that I'm one of the the spirituals. Um, on the other hand, there's a really harsh asceticism. A, uh, um, 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 they don't eat vegetables or meat, or they don't eat certain types of meat or whatever it is, um, and, and extreme forms of fasting because of their 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 loathing of the material body <laughs> and attempt to set the spirit free. Um, so I just want to make sure we're. Uh, I thought that was a really yeah, important it, point to make sure we it's, emphasize. It's just a conservative version of once saved, always saved. Mm -hmm. There you go. Oh, but woo. <laughs> <laughs> they could have just a similar to effect <laughs> just trying to stir the problems that's all <laughs> i know i know yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no you're you're exactly right uh matthew in in the sense that not josh uh, not josh is not exactly right matthew no, is josh exactly is right. not exactly right now <laughs> <laughs> i'm just yeah, not I'm, I'm, I, 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 I'm just uh putting my finger to the wind to see how that comment goes before <laughs> oh, I take no. a side yeah, either way yeah, or the yeah, other. Yeah. No. Um, but yeah, that's exa if, if matter doesn't matter, if, if the flesh is intrinsically evil, then uh, we can either do whatever we want and it doesn't matter. But um, the, the whole 
concept is that there is this infinite chasm between the spiritual and the physical, right? They just, uh, they, they don't relate to each other at all. Whereas the biblical view is, uh, of the human person anyway, is one of, a, of what we could call psychosomatic unity, right? So we are physical and we are spiritual uh, beings at the same time. The Gnostics did not believe that. And like I said before, they, the Gnostics divided people into these three different classes, right? The um, carnal or the material people, the psychical or the soulish people, and the pneumatics, right? The carnal people were hopeless. They were just, you know, condemned to perdition no matter what. The psychical or the soulish folks, uh, if they lived a, a good life uh, and, and believed, then they could possibly find rest in this sort of intermediate realm. But the only ones who would be truly saved are the pneumatics. Uh, the other thing that Irenaeus points out in the first book is how these Gnostic teachers disagree among themselves, right? There, there's no such thing as one uh, Gnosticism and one Gnostic teacher. So, for instance, Saturninus, he taught that the Savior had no real birth nor body since procreation is from Satan himself, right? Um, and of course, intense. Yeah, it is intense. And so you, you, can, you can imagine where you know, he that stood. that guy yeah, exactly. So you you can see <laughs> where he's hypocrite. or a hypocrite. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Man, Josh with the zingers today, you're on fire. <laughs> so Saturninus taught that uh, you know the the savior was not actually born because well procreation is um, it, it's bad, it's evil, it's gross, it's nasty, right? Uh, Basilides. Um, who Valentinus followed, Basilides presents his own version of the first begotten noose, right? That was one of the names of the eons that uh, Matthew mentioned before, right? So Basilides taught that there was this uh, first begotten noose who is also called the Christ. And this Christ appeared to be a man and appeared to do miracles, uh, but he actually didn't die, right? Uh, in Basilides' thought, Simon of Cyrene was the one crucified while Jesus escaped and he transformed into the appearance of Simon of Cyrene. And in, in an interesting point here, uh, Basilides taught, according to Irenaeus, that uh, Jesus, looking like Simon of Cyrene, actually stood off to the side laughing at Simon of Cyrene being crucified in, in his place. Another teacher mm -hmm. named—go ahead— well, yeah, so they're using, the Gnostics are using scriptural passages and they are um, twisting them and, and, uh, and making them support their own, um, their own Gnostic teaching and theology. And, um, and this is, I mean, we, I mean, we, we see that, we talked about that, um, uh, not only in Back to the Fathers, but on various Remnant Radio episodes as well, that how that happens in, in the church today. But this, this is kind of another level here. I mean, this is, this is um, just completely twisting the details of a, of a scriptural narrative, um, such as the Simon and Cyrene taking the place of Jesus. So it's just, uh, it's, uh, yeah. it's something that will really bother Irenaeus. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. The proper interpretation of Scripture is a huge concern for Irenaeus, mm -hmm. as we'll find, you know, because once he gets done outlining the various Gnostic teachings and then refutes them from kind of an internal philosophical logical perspective, uh, he will get into the Scriptures themselves and in how do we understand those Scriptures properly? Uh, what do they actually teach? What is the faith that the apostles uh, handed mm -hmm. down. Whereas today, oftentimes the debates among various Christians, they have to do with the interpretation of Scripture, but it's largely among Christians who are agreed on the core of the faith as it's expressed, say, in the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. Mm -hmm. And like you said, Matthew, right. this is a whole different ball game uh, here. You know, it's interesting. There's There is shades of the same kind of critique of you know, the historical criticism that came against Christianity in the late 1800s and early 1900s and, and has persisted to today, because those are the same arguments that you still see today about Jesus. Um, and, and in here, it's but the Gnostic guys are trying to co-opt Jesus and co-opt the, the uh, 
the biblical narrative to fit within them. And today you find people using those same arguments to destroy the Christian narrative. Um, so, you know, interesting to be able to go through Irenaeus, not, not only from that and what you're about to do, not only from that philosophical place, but also that biblical place to show, you know, actually there has been a preserved strain within Christianity, the, you know, the largest within Christianity that Jesus actually did come. Jesus actually was born. Jesus actually did assume flesh. And that's never been in, not never been contested from a orthodox historical Christian perspective. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And he gets into exactly that when he uh, in books three through uh, three and four, especially when he gets into the scriptures themselves, into the writings of the apostles, into the gospels them themselves, and even going into the Old Testament, which is another important aspect of. Uh, Irenaeus' presentation of the Christian faith against the Gnostics. But some of the other Gnostics that he interacts with, uh, one guy named Carpocrates, he claimed that Jesus was just an ordinary man who had received power from the Father to escape the angels or the eons who created the world. So even, even Jesus uh, is trying to escape the world. There's this escapism of matter that is a common thread throughout the Gnostics. Um, no, I'm, I'm just just to ask a question or pose a question, and maybe both of you guys are familiar with this, because I've heard critiques against this in the, in, the, in the context of Gnosticism, and it's the statement that we can make today that um, I'm just a spiritual being having a temporary human experience. And I don't know if you, either of you guys have heard that statement get thrown, thrown around. But sometimes it sounds like it has shades of this escapism, this spirituality. Spirit, my spiritual substance is more important than my material substance. And I'm curious if you guys have ever come across that or had thoughts about that. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, in my own experience, uh, pastoring a, a church, uh, I find that I find that a lot. P uh, people are are you know, very concerned about their soul or their spiritual life, um, almost to the exclusion of, of the body. Sure. I think also where I find this uh, influencing modern day Christianity is the, uh, you know, the point of Christianity is to forgive us of our sins so that we can go to heaven when we die. Right. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. And not that that is necessarily false in and of itself, but as N.T. Wright you know, argues time and time and time and time again, that's not the end of the story. Christianity is not so much concerned about life after death as it is life after life after death, uh, which right. includes the redemption of of the material creation itself. Uh, and again, we'll get into that. Irenaeus gets into that all the way back in the second century. But yes, I have seen that. Matthew, what about you? No, I definitely see it as well. I don't want to um, take too much time here i could say sure. a lot about this but it is um no I, I definitely think that very statement i'm just a spiritual being living in a temporary human experience is is i mean it, it it that statement itself makes a claim that the human experience is is uh is not spiritual <laughs> whereas right, right. Um, god has created us as, as spiritual and material beings um, body and soul and as uh, as as father ron says is, uh, quoting into you right that um, the the resurrection of the flesh is just and, and our life in a new heavens and a new earth is uh, is where the story goes. Precisely, yeah, precisely. Mm -hmm. So, um, the last Gnostic teacher or Gnostic ish teacher that I want to mention from Irenaeus's first book, of course, is uh, Marcion, who one of my seminary professors mm -hmm. des described as uh, his favorite heretic. Uh, because he, he wrote his he wrote his doctoral dissertation on Marcion, but uh, again, I think Marcion has relevance to a lot of Christianity today because Marcion mm -hmm. taught that the God of the Old Testament was evil uh, and not the right. Father of Jesus Christ, and mm -hmm. uh, Marcion even uh, mutilated the Scripture in such a way that uh, all of the Old Testament gets cut out, uh, and the vast majority of the New Testament, just a uh, an altered version of Luke's Gospel. And a smattering of epistles makes up. Uh, so it's one thing to interpret the Bible according to your teaching. It's another thing altogether 
to just cut mm. books out of it if they don't agree <laughs> right. with your right right uh, well and what's interesting is this time there was n there was no official um list of of the scriptures written down which we we see we see in Irenaeus but there wasn't like you know people didn't carry their bibles around and had the table of contents you know <laughs> no everything. you, you was, couldn't go to Mardell back then exactly exactly yeah. there were still certain there were still certain books that were under debate, you know, as to are these part of the list? Are they part of the canon? Um, Hebrew, James, and Revelation. There were others in circulation at this time. But Irenaeus is an early testament. That's part of his defense against the against the Gnostics, is to say that no, these are the books. <laughs> this uh, the, the the Marcion has cut out books, <laughs> and some mm -hmm. of the Gnostics have added books. But here's the ones we really need to go by. Here's the ones that the apostles either wrote or taught. Or, um, or uh, someone that knew an apostle, an apostle wrote. Yeah, one of the interesting aspects of, uh, of his third book, where he really starts to interact with the scriptures, is his defense of the four, what would become the four mm -hmm. canonical gospels, Matthew, Mark, <laughs> Luke, and John. Uh, and of course, he, so against Marcion, he says, you need all four. Against other Gnostics, he says, no more than these. These are... These are the mm -hmm. authoritative, sufficient testimonies to the life and, and teaching of our Lord. Uh, but before we get to book three, uh, we get to book, uh, book two. And that's where Irenaeus really enters into a demonstration of the absurdity and the logical inconsistency of Gnostic beliefs. And so in it, he attempts a thorough refutation. He, he argues that God is the creator of heaven and earth, right? Mm -hmm. And the creator of heaven and earth is the same, and the creator of heaven and earth is the one true God, not some lesser deity, not some eon or an emanation. He charges the heretics of impiety uh, against the creator by blaspheming his created work, uh, that, that denigrating creation actually denigrates the creator. And so he presents arguments against the many various deities which the Valentinians believed and he chastises them for all of their numerological speculation. You know, he says that, you know, you're not going to find salvation in numbers and syllables and uh, things like that. Secondly, the Gnostic heretics are not only blaspheming the one true God, but they're blaspheming Christ by teaching that he was produced by a defective world or uh, emanates from a defective uh, being. And Irenaeus argues that Christ truly became human. He truly, you know, took on flesh, dwelt among us. He suffered. He died. He rose again to destroy death and to grant eternal life, right? Christ didn't just appear to be a human, but for Irenaeus, and we'll get into this point a little bit later, it's absolutely vital to the Christian message that Christ did all of the things he did in the flesh and that mm -hmm. he did all of those things in actual history, Right? right in an actual right. time in an actual place right uh in in christ didn't just appear to be human but rather he in the words of irenaeus sanctified every stage of human development by participating in it himself right so i just think that's so easy to, to take for granted there's not many many christians or many people that would deny that Jesus Christ was a human being that suffered and died in the flesh. You know, now now Christians will believe that he rose again, ascended into heaven in that flesh. But it's just it it's a little difficult probably for us more today to to connect why why was that such a big deal? But for the Gnostics, again, as Father Ron, you mentioned that they the flesh was evil. Um, and so for God to have contact with the human flesh um would be uh, would potentially uh, um be in some way to denigrate the the divine nature, or or and 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 or to say that Jesus was somehow subject or or um, wrapped up in evil material body. So this is um, this was huge for Irenaeus to make boldly make this claim against the Gnostics about these historical actions that Jesus did in a human body, in human flesh. Absolutely, and the grounding of all that is that. Um... The, you know, the reason the Gnostics believed that, that the Incarnation denigrates the deity is because not only is creation inferior, creation is, is actually evil intrinsically. Uh, it's, it's not just fallen, 
right? It's not something that was good that has fallen. It was intrinsically evil to begin with. Irenaeus, of course, will argue that, uh, no, God, the, the creation is good. It's God's good creation that has fallen into disrepair, that has fallen into decay and corruption and death, uh, and, and the union of, uh, of God and man is integral to the, the elevation, uh, the restoration of that, of that goodness uh, to the created order. So uh, that's book one and book two. Getting into book three, that's the, the real meat of Irenaeus's presentation of the Christian faith. And uh, Irenaeus is referred to by some historians as, as really the first systematic theologian uh, of, of Christianity because of the orderly way in which he sets out the, the faith of Christianity, the faith of the church. And so uh, book three divides into two sections. One highlights the monotheism taught in the Old Testament, and one that emphasizes the unique manifestation of God in Jesus Christ. But before he starts quoting Scripture, and this is one of the important aspects of Irenaeus's uh, teaching, before he, he quotes Scripture, Irenaeus lays the foundation for its authority. What's hmm. crucial for him and what helps illuminate his concept of Scripture is that uh, the apostolic succession of the leaders of the church. Um, apostolic succession. Those are, yes. uh, that's the keynote word for today. Tell us, what, what do you mean by that? Yeah. Okay, so uh, in Irenaeus's uh, mind, and, and th this is a key aspect in the development of what we can call early Catholicism, and I'm using that term again, not uh, in a sectarian way to refer to the contemporary Roman Catholic Church, um, but the early Christian Church, which was just the one holy Catholic and apostolic church referred to in the creeds. Um, an aspect of early Catholicism was, uh, for Irenaeus, um, how, how can we trust that one, what somebody teaches uh, is true, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, why isn't what Valentinus teaches true? Why isn't what Carpocrates taught true? What, what makes, you know, you have your truth, I have my truth, right? So for Irenaeus, yeah. <laughs> what was important was that uh, there be a, a clear line of succession of two things. Number one, of the teaching itself, that the teaching is handed down intact, unchanged, unaltered from Christ to his apostles, from the apostles to their successors, and from those successors to their successors, which eventually, you know, became the, the bishops, right? The overseers of the church. Um, and so it was not only a proper succession of teaching, but a proper succession of person. So that by the time of Irenaeus, there's an importance given to each bishop being able to say, uh, who did he succeed? And then who did his predecessor succeed? to be able to trace mm -hmm. their lineage all the way back to the apostles. Does that make sense? Right. So we had a, I remember a remnant radio episode that brought on an, an Anglican guy and he had a, he had a whole uh, frame of, 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 of his apostolic succession of, of bishops that were laid hands on by this bishop, by that bishop, by that bishop, by that bishop, they went all the way back down. And so we, we see like in, in, in the Anglican tradition, for example, and the Orthodox and Catholic um, apostolic succession is still a very vital um, aspect of, of, of those particular traditions. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so, of course, while the apostles were uh, traveling about and preaching, uh, you know, it was pretty obvious if this is apostles teaching or, or not. But as more time and space separated the time of the actual apostles, uh, you not only needed to establish this this lineage of uh, of leaders and teachers to ensure that what was being taught was truly apostolic, uh, but there was also recognize the need to have a written touchstone of of that teaching as well, uh, and thus, you know, the the we start to move into the understanding of canonical scriptures. Right, the early Christians 
Orthodox, not the Gnostics, but the, you know, the early Christians accepted the Old Testament as their Bible. But these various New Testament writings uh, were, were sort of tested for, okay, does this match the faith of the apostles? And so an interesting interplay happens here, whereby on the one hand, uh, the scriptures are accepted on the basis of whether or not they bear witness to the apostles' teaching, but also what is taught is tested by these writings. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You know, Tra tradition and scripture go, going hand in hand. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I know that raises some hackles uh, in in some Christian circles today, um, but that's. That's primarily because of much, 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 much later debates of the relationship between scripture and, and tradition. Right, the right. So Irenaeus was concerned to say, here's um, here's the gospel that was handed down. That's what the traditio means, to hand down. Yeah. Um, yep. And to so be delivered. That's for, right, to be delivered, to be handed over, hand, handed down. That's uh, um, Irenaeus saying, I, my gospel, I know my gospel is correct, because I got it from Polycarp, and Polycarp got it directly from the Apostle John. <laughs> so he's he's making that appeal to that 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 line, that tradition of the handing down of the faith um, directly from the Apostle. Yeah, absolutely. I, I already got my controversial statements in, so I won't say anything about Sola Scriptura. So go ahead. <laughs> Except you just did, but uh... oh. <laughs> <laughs> Just for full clarity's sake, I'm just having fun. Right. Yes, uh, yes. Right. So I've got some right, comments right, right, in there. Right. I'm, yeah. I'm not trying yeah. to make a comment on where I stand theologically. I'm just having right, fun right. the conversation. That's all. Exactly. Well, so I just think for Irenaeus, too, he was seeing what was happening with what the Gnostics were doing with the scriptures and what Marcion was doing. They were mutilating them. They were twisting them, turning them, changing them, <laughs> all types of, of things and saying, no, this is the way it needs to be understood the Gnostics come and come into our secret sect and be enlightened on, on what it really says. And so Irenaeus is, it's, he's, he's looking at this, he's saying, look, we're, we've, we've got to make another appeal here. Um, let's look at what John himself taught before he died and which is aligned with these scriptures. Um, but here's, here's how they were intended to be understood. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so there's again, this, uh, this interplay between scripture and tradition um, mm -hmm. which I'm an Anglican, but honestly, I, I think it its most organic development through the centuries of the Church uh, is in the Orthodox understanding of tradition. Being, I mean, the whole thing is tradition. It's all, everything right. is tradition with big T. It's been handed down, right? Including so, the scriptures. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's not scripture yeah. versus tradition. It's not two columns of authority. The scriptures themselves are part of this process, this Holy Spirit directed process of handing down the faith once delivered, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And so you, you find the roots of this in, in the writings of, of Irenaeus. Um, and so... So this he establishes the the authority of scripture uh, by saying that you know these scriptures we know faithfully testify to the teaching of the apostles. That's the touchstone, apostolic teaching. Does this line up with what the apostles taught? For Irenaeus, that's the whole um, that's the whole thing, and he uses. Uh, he, he, he makes an example of the Episcopal succession in the city of Rome. Again, you can, you know, I'm not going to get into the modern polemics of Roman Catholics versus Protestants versus Orthodox, but just from an historical perspective, he, he looks at the, uh, you know, the Episcopal succession in Rome as, okay, we mm -hmm. know that this guy goes back to this guy, and this guy goes back to this guy, and they all teach the same thing. Right. They all taught the same thing, right? And then if, if you go into another city— they may speak a different language, but they're teaching the same thing. And in another city, right. speaking a different language, have a different culture, but they're teaching the same thing. And so he provides parameters with, when, with which Scripture can receive its proper interpretation. It's not enough just simply to say the Bible says. It's also necessary to interpret those Scriptures uh, in a way that is you know, in conjunction with the apostolic faith. And so this is one of the mm -hmm. earliest delineations of these, uh, of the relationship between scripture and tradition in the early church. Um, in the third book, 
he, he focuses on the Christian faith based on the apostles' teaching. Uh, and he dives right in, and he warns about associating with heretics, right? This would not be a very popular understanding today, but he warns about associating with heretics based on Paul's admonition in Titus not to have anything to do with them. And he illustrates it by telling mm-hmm. two, uh, two interesting stories. The first is uh, that one time while at the, the baths in Ephesus, the apostle John saw the heretic Serenthus, uh and exclaimed, let us flee in case this bathhouse falls down, because Serenthus, the enemy of truth, is inside. <laughs> so, you know, can you mention <laughs> walking into a public bathroom and seeing a heretic and, you know, running away because you're afraid the whole edifice is going to fall, right? This is When you're uh, 90 years old or however. <laughs> yes, it, exactly. <laughs> pretty pretty elder, elderly guy. Um, and then in another occasion, uh, it's... He writes that Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna, saw Marcion and just said to him, I know who you are. You are the firstborn of Satan. So (laughs) talk about, you know, here's, you know, Irenaeus, man of peace. Uh, But furthermore, the apostles taught that, that Jesus Christ redeemed us with his own blood so that we could become a holy people. Christ came from David's body. Christ was not one and Jesus another, right? This is something the Gnostics do all the time, is they separate the Christ from the man Jesus, right? Right. Irenaeus says, no, according to the apostles, the man Jesus and the Christ are one. That's the whole point. The Word of God became flesh and was anointed by the Spirit from the Father so that humans might become the children of God, right? This is where we start to get into um, the understanding, you know, you know, the Son of God became man so that men might become sons of God, right? That whole sort of mm-hmm. divine ex- exchange. Right. Well, did Irenaeus codify that? He, he was one of the first people who talked about in that way, correct? Uh, yes, he is. Um, and of course, he, he didn't originate the concept, but he's one of sure. the first. Yeah, he, he's one of the first to actually articulate it like that. Now, uh, Athanasius later on will be even more explicit about it. Um, in the development of the doctrine of theosis or or divinization, mm-hmm. uh, you know, God became man so that man could become God, and that doesn't mean we become, you know, something other than what we are. But this whole idea that we, as Peter writes in uh, in the New Testament, we become partakers of the divine nature. Right. 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 So we hit on this a bit in last week's episode too, folks. So you can tune in if you want to hear a little bit of talk on divinization as opposed to divination which is bad <laughs> divinization right. which is good that's right, that's right. right right so Irenaeus argues that that Paul for instance uh Paul knew no other Christ except the one that suffered died and rose again 1 Corinthians 15 right that's the only Christ that Paul knew he didn't know Christ here and then the man Jesus here they are one and the same And when Paul refers to the passion of our Lord, he uses the name Christ, which is contrary to the Gnostic idea that the Christ departed from the man Jesus at the time of the crucifixion. Um, And so in order to be a mediator between God and man, as 1 Timothy Timothy says that he is, Christ necessarily must be human and God. So even before we get into the great Christological debates of the 4th century, here is Irenaeus setting forth the apostolic doctrine that Christ is human uh, and divine, right? All in, in, in one person. Uh, the Christ that is born of Mary is the seed promised in Genesis 3, uh, verse 15. The preaching of the church mm-hmm. is consistent with this teaching from the prophets, the apostles, and all the disciples. Irenaeus brings the Old Testament prophets into it, because the Gnostics believed that the prophets wrote and spoke by inspiration of a lesser deity, not of mm. the, the, the one true God. Irenaeus says, uh-uh, uh, the prophets, the apostles, they all agree. It all points to Jesus the Christ, the Word made flesh, dwelling among us, who suffered, died, rose again, will you right. know, come again and with, if, with glory. Mm-hmm. Right, and if you read... Irenaeus' demonstration 
of the apostolic preaching, which is a much shorter work and more of a positive account or apologetic for Christianity. Um, he just he goes through so many of uh, the old the Old Testament has such a Christological focus and interpretation. Um, and he'll he'll from from Genesis three to Noah and the flood to you know Abraham and and so and so he just go and through the prophets and he's showing contra the Gnostics that um, the prophets that that all the Old Testament was actually prophesying about the man Jesus Christ, whereas um, as you mentioned already the, the Gnostics thought that the prophets were um, were were inspired by the by the eons to promote their theology, but but uh, Irenaeus saying no old and, and this is also against Marcion, who has totally cut off the Old Testament, saying this is too Jewish for us. This is too. There's an evil god that created um, um, uh, the evil god of the Old Testament. Irenaeus against both of them is saying no. This is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and everything in these Old Testament scriptures actually prophesy to the coming Christ in the flesh. Yeah. Yep. So, so Father Ron, um, he's dealt. So Irenaeus deals with the the Old Testament. He deals with the teaching of the apostles and the tradition. What, where in does he hone in on the words of Christ or the teachings of Christ in specific? How does he approach that? Interestingly, uh, yeah, in Book Four he gets into uh, the words spoken by Christ, um, but in 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 mentioning that, he's not just simply referring to the the words attributed to him into the Gospels, but he considers the Old Testament words spoken by Christ. This is an interesting part of Irenaeus's interpretation of Scripture. Uh, he views the Old Testament not as a Jewish book co-opted by Christians, but he he views it as a Christocentric uh, book. Uh, the writings of the Old Testament are uh, just as much about Christ as the writings of the New Testament. And so he's referring to how the Old Testament scriptures point to Jesus himself. So for Irenaeus, the writings of Moses, the writings of the prophets, uh, these are the words of Christ as well. Jesus said that Abraham, who believed God the Creator, rejoiced to see Jesus, right, in John chapter 8, verse 56. Uh, it's through Jesus that God introduces Abraham and his seed, which Irenaeus understands to be the church, right? Uh, Abraham's seed uh, are, are those who believe in Christ and who are united to him in his body, Galatians 3.29. Moses was not ignorant of Jesus' passion, since Christ is the fulfillment of the Passover, right? The, the, the Passover itself is read Christologically in the light of the, uh, the death right. and resurrection of Jesus himself. Uh, the prophets also, uh, in, in what they foresee, they foresee Christ because they prayed uh, for it to come, for, for his, his advent, right? Um, Christ is the, the end of the law because in him the law finds its meaning. Uh, by him extending it and fulfilling it. So when we talk about the end of the law, we don't mean like the end point termination. We mean the end as in its purpose, its fulfillment, mm -hmm. the, even the purpose, the telos, right? In Greek, the telos of the law is 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 in Christ, right? Um, Irenaeus also, uh, also brings the Eucharist into his argument against uh, the, the Gnostics. And of course, this could get us into a whole other uh, <laughs> direction of the discussion in terms of, of sacramental theology. But I think to our point, what we find is that uh, Irenaeus is not simply arguing uh, separate little theological points. Rather, he's arguing uh, his whole point from a worldview, which was vastly mm -hmm. different from the worldview of the Gnostics. So for instance, in looking at the Eucharist, Irenaeus says, you know, that the bread, right, which is a product of the land, which is then worked by human hands, right? The bread consists of two realities in the Eucharist, earthly and heavenly, right? And so for Irenaeus, he writes that, so also our bodies, when they receive the Eucharist, are no longer corruptible, since they now have the hope of the resurrection to eternity. And mm -hmm. so in the physical act of eating the bread and, and drinking the wine, 
there is a true participation in the life-giving flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. And the Gnostics couldn't stand this because flesh, blood, bread, wine, this is all right. earthy stuff. We're supposed to be escaping this, right? Right, uh, right. So so for Irenaeus, then the again, it's when there's a there's a symbolic significance of the Eucharist, but it's not a symbol in the sense that that nothing happens when you eat it. So for Irenaeus, that some type of heavenly participation, some kind of sharing in the life of God is occurring whenever you've partake of the Lord's Supper. Yes, and in a unique way by mm -hmm. means mm -hmm. of of, mm -hmm. of the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. uh, in other right. words, Which we... Is Go ahead. Totally anti-Gnostic. So for because the Gnostic right. is that the, the, the spirit and the material realm cannot cannot have contact. That's a, that matter is evil and that matter can in no way benefit the spirit. At best, it's some sort of accommodation. At worst, it um, it uh, it's it's evil. And so this is Irenaeus is making a, a very pointed claim against the Gnostic worldview in this statement. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, Irenaeus talks quite a bit about about the Eucharist, and um, and again, he, he Irenaeus is is writing out of a tradition that's already in place. I think that's another thing mm -hmm. that's important to understand. He's he's not inventing things out of thin air. So Irenaeus's understanding of the Eucharist, he's explicating an understanding that's already present. Uh, in, in the church at the time of this writing. And so the Eucharist is a participation in Jesus Christ, and it's a participation in all of the realities that are, you know, that, that lead to our salvation. And like you said, the Gnostics, you know, had no time for that. They, they had no place for that. Um, you know, some have suggested that uh, memorialist understandings of the Eucharist uh, in mm -hmm. modern day, uh, are closer right. to the Gnostics than, right. than to today. I would argue that. Uh, yeah, you're I, not I as convinced. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm not as. I obviously don't agree with those views, but but mm -hmm. the, what makes them not Gnostic is that the Gnostics didn't care about those things. Right. Uh, right. At least Christians who hold memorialist views of the Lord's Supper um, still value the incarnation and the saving death and resurrection of Jesus, the Gnostics didn't. Absolutely. They did not value mm -hmm. those things uh, at all. Yeah, it's, uh, not a, it's not a result of, a, of matter being evil, is what you're saying. That's not what the memorialist view holds to. Yes, yeah. I believe it's a mistaken understanding of the relationship between matter and spirit, but it is not mm -hmm. a denigration of right. matter like like the Gnostics, right. uh, like the Gnostics would would. Yeah, good clarification. Right. So, um, I think we're we're kind of getting past time here. Uh, so I want to look real quick at the fifth book, right? The the last book, and that's where Irenaeus really gets into the meat of redemption and in the life of the world to come, which is where he we find a lot of uh, of divergence between Gnosticism. And apostolic Christianity. So in book five, Irenaeus uh, presents further proofs from, from the Old Testament, further proofs from the letters of the apostles to persuade and convert the lost and to strengthen the minds of, of newcomers, right? The Lord redeemed us through his own blood, uh, uniting humanity to God and bestowing uh, immortality to man. And none of this would be possible uh, having argued this from the scriptures, none of this would be possible if Christ was only a man in appearance, right? He has to be man in actuality, possessing flesh and blood. And so the Eucharist, again, getting back to that, it depicts the real body and blood of the Lord that was crushed and poured out on the cross, and this was no invisible body without bones or flesh. And so our bodies mm. also, right, after we suffer decomposition, you know, will later rise at the appointed time to the glory of God. So Irenaeus sets forth uh, the the hope of the resurrection as proclaimed by the apostles, so that uh, the Christian hope is not that we will one day escape this earthly prison and ascend to our heavenly home, right? That's Gnosticism. We know that our bodies will die and return to the earth, but that they will one day again rise and be transformed. 
and indeed mm -hmm. the whole creation will will be renewed uh, as well, right? And so when we talk about spiritual bodies, like Paul talks about spiritual bodies uh, in First Corinthians, as opposed to he's he doesn't mean immaterial, right? He doesn't mean immaterial right. bodies. He just means uh, mortal bodies that have been made immortal and transformed by the Spirit. That's what makes them spiritual right. bodies. He, he still calls the he still calls them bodies. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right. Abs mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um. So Irenaeus, uh, he sort of ends Book 5 uh, with a discussion of the last things, with eschatology, uh, harmonizing 2 Thessalonians, Daniel, and Revelation, uh, to <laughs> basically marshalling all of these together to argue that the Gnostic teachers are agents of Satan against God, right? That uh, That's always a good insult. It, yeah, it really is. You know, <laughs> again, the, the theological carpet bombing... Uh, just yes. keeps keeps going. Uh, I mean, it's firmly in line with Jesus, right? You're of your father, the devil. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But but yeah. he likens them, you know, as those who refuse to love the truth, those who embrace falsehood, and thus they will be condemned along with the Antichrist who leads apostates to himself, right? Um, and so he he doesn't just think of the Gnostics as you know brethren who have a different view. Uh, he, he looks at them as agents of Satan because they are spiritually harmful and they lead souls uh, away from salvation and into, uh, into perdition, right? Uh, the, the last bit that I want to talk about uh, of Irenaeus, and probably you guys who have read Irenaeus have been you know, waiting for this, is that Irenaeus yes. expands <laughs> upon the idea of uh, recapitulation, That's right? right. Mm -hmm. This is one of his lasting contributions to the theology of redemption in the early church, is the idea of recapitulation. Now again, Irenaeus does not invent it, right? But he expands on Romans 5 uh, in Jesus being the new Adam. So uh, the process of redemption is Jesus, the new Adam, treading obediently over the same ground that the old Adam ruined by his disobedience. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Christ takes yeah, the... Uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, just every 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 action. One of the things I love about recapitulation, I, Irenaeus is where I first um, was introduced to the concept years ago when I uh, first read a kind of a summation of Against Heresies. I, I, hadn't, I was a, just blown away by the concept and because it emphasized the life of Christ, where growing up in a traditional non-denominational structure, the emphasis is usually on the crucifixion and the virgin birth. And you miss a lot of those middle bits, you know, great teachings, that kind of stuff. But when looked through the lens of recapitulation, it puts great importance on every action in the life of Jesus, because he sums up the entire story of mankind and retells the story essentially by being the new Adam. And when 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 I saw that lens, I thought, my goodness, it, it, it gives you such a beautiful picture of the purpose of the incarnation beyond, you know, the the, the or the function of the incarnation beyond, uh, well, he had to be born a virgin and then he had to die a sinless death. So what what happens with and, and you know, he all so much of what he does is archetypally pointed out in the Old Testament. And so, and I love that Irenaeus just pulls all these examples out and goes, look, Moses took the Israelites to the wilderness. Jesus goes to the wilderness. They go for 40 years. He goes for 40 days. You know, there's so many parallels there that, uh, I that recapitulation is one of my favorite things to dwell on in terms of Irenaeus. Yeah, I think... Um, it I can remember, you know, being a kid and, and you're you're playing a game, whether it's, you know, playing with friends outside or whether it's uh, playing a video game. And, you know, w when just the wheels come off, what do you do? You do a do over. And you just say, right. do over, right? Which means you get a clean, <laughs> yes. you know, and, and do it the right way. Or in the case of like, you know, playing the, the NES as I did, you know, as a kid, you just hit the reset button. And everything, right. you know, sort of reboots. It, 
in, in, in recapitulation is sort of the great do-over, right? So the, you know, the original Adam is the fountain of the old humanity, uh, and, and he screwed it up, and everyone else is screwed up uh, by then, and everything has fallen into ruin. So the, the, the incarnation is the great reboot, right? And so the new Adam retreads all of that experience, all of that life, all of that ground, and and sanctifies it, right? He, and so like you said, Josh, uh, that, you know, if we, if we focus exclusively on the atonement aspect of the cross, we may look at the incarnation as just sort of a precursor to the crucifixion, right? Mm-hmm. It, it's just sort yeah. of a pre, you know, a necessary precursor. Re, uh, recapitulation sort of moves those goalposts in saying mm-hmm. that creation itself happened so that the incarnation could happen. Yeah. Right. Right. <sighs> That's well put. It's just, mm-hmm. it's, it's beautiful. Uh, so Christ takes the, the whole human experience and the created order itself into himself and redeems it through his, through his righteousness, right? Through his, mm-hmm. uh, and so um, I kind of close on, on that with, uh, with a, a rather lengthy quote from Irenaeus himself, just because I think it, it, it sums up this whole idea so beautifully. Irenaeus says, he has therefore in his work of recapitulation, so he actually uses the word, summed up all things, both waging war against our enemy and crushing him who at the beginning led us away captives in Adam and trampled upon his head, as you can perceive in Genesis, that God said to the serpent, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall be on the watch for your head and you on the watch for his heel. For from that time, He who should be born of a woman, namely from the virgin, after the likeness of Adam, was preached as keeping watch for the head of the serpent. This is the seed of which the apostle says in the epistle to the Galatians that the law of works was established until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. This fact is exhibited in a still clearer light in the same epistle where he thus speaks. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son born of a woman. For indeed, the enemy would not have been fairly vanquished unless it had been a man born of a woman who conquered him. For it was by means of a woman that he got the advantage over man at first, setting himself up as man's opponent. And therefore does the Lord profess himself to be the son of man, comprising in himself that original man out of whom the woman was fashioned. In order that as our species went down to death through a vanquished man, so we may ascend to life again through a victorious one. I just think that's beautiful. That's good. Absolutely I love how good. I love. It seems like he's incorporating. Um, it, it gives. It actually gives Mary a prominent place in the redemptive narrative. Right. Um, and I love. I love. It was the first time I saw. You know, having been again raised non-denominationally, raised evangelically, and. And just thinking of Mary in kind of a vague sense in in Irenaeus, I went, oh, she's part of the story. Like it just started to dawn on me that he mm-hmm. came from Mary. You know, the first Eve, everything fell apart with Eve, but everything started to come together through Mary. And it was like, oh, my goodness, the story's being retold. And it helped me to to see the value there where sometimes it can be difficult in the evangelical tradition to see the value in in Mary's role in the whole thing. Yeah, precisely. So I think just to sort of summarize, uh, you know, with a few closing thoughts here of my own, and then we'll get closing thoughts from Matthew and and Josh. To recap, you know, Irenaeus is considered by many to be the first systematic theologian of, of Christianity. He wouldn't have referred to himself as such. But when, uh, when you look at the fact that, in the midst of addressing a specific problem, uh, he doesn't just address the specific problem. He then presents in an ordered form the faith of, of Christianity uh, in accordance with the scriptures and with the apostolic tradition. Irenaeus uh, gives us a beautiful witness to the Christological typology of reading the Old Testament uh, and seeing the Old Testament not as something that is is just sort of a you know, a preview, 
but it is itself a Christological uh, witness. And I think that has value not only against the Marcionites of then, but also among some Christians today who say things like, well, I'm a New Testament Christian, not an Old Testament Christian, right? Or I, I love the father of Jesus, but not that mean God of the Old Testament, right? Um, right? That mean God of the Old Testament is the father of our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Um, like we just touched on, Irenaeus bears witness to the importance of the incarnation as a redemptive act itself, not just a precursor to his atoning death uh, on, on the cross. He bears witness to the relationship between Scripture and apostolic tradition, uh, the rule of faith, and the apostolic succession. So he stands as an important witness to the development of, of early Catholicism uh, in, in the post apostolic period. And finally, you know, for my, uh, for my money, his sacramental worldview, right? Uh, for Irenaeus, matter matters. And because of the incarnation, uh, matter is, is not only good and important, but it is also, uh, it's the means whereby we receive the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And this includes through uh, the, the sacramental rites and practices of, of the Christian church. So, Matthew, uh, any closing thoughts on this? No, that's good. I thought that was a great presentation. And I, I love, um, a, a, again, as you both have mentioned, just the, the recapitulation theme in Irenaeus and creation occurring so that the, the Son of God could become incarnate. I mean, and that's, I love this, I, this, what, he emphasizes so much is that it is a taking in the incarnation. It's, it's Jesus taking us into himself. Um, and I just think that says so much more than kind of a, a looking at Jesus merely as someone that has done something in our place, which he has, but by at the cross, by dying for our sins, but in the, in, at the incarnation, he's, He's 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 united himself with humanity and in, in the most uh, in the most powerful um, way imaginable, and I think this is just uh, against the Gnostics, just such a um, not only uh, not only beautiful in its own right, but against the Gnostics again, who would regard the material realm as an accommodation at best or or evil at worst. Um, that this is saying no, that God has actually ordained flesh as a means to bring about redemption to all of humanity and beyond that, all of creation. Um, and that there is going to be a new heavens and a new earth with, with, with real immortal bodies, um, like that of the risen Christ. And I just, um, I don't know. I just, I just, I just love meditating on that. And I just, I think it's a call mm -hmm. today to really think about the importance of, 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 of matter, of the material realm, of how God um, came into direct contact with humanity through the flesh of Christ. And then as we've, just as our theme has been this month, um, and, and Irenaeus talks about this with the Eucharist, is that coming and still meeting with us and commuting with us through material actions um, like mm -hmm. the sacraments, um, especially the Eucharist, that that is still a way in which divine life is communicated to um, to the pe to to God's people, as Christ Himself is, is, is Irenaeus puts it, is in His flesh is depicted to us <laughs> in the Lord's Supper in the Eucharist. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's. Uh, I, I thought about something when you mentioned, uh, you know, that this whole idea that that creation happened so that the incarnation could happen. That's that actually uh, fits in with with a rabbinic tradition among the Jews mm -hmm. uh, that says that that God created the world in order that he might give it the Torah. Hmm. So, so that it, it, it's not, you know, God created things and then, you know, well, we got to put the Torah in there to instruct them. That uh, in this rabbinic Jewish view, mm -hmm. you know, the whole point of creation is so that God could have a setting for the Torah, right? So you, you, you fast forward that into Christological understanding and it's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, God created uh, the world in order that he might, you know, become incarnate in it, in the person of his son. Yeah. It's, it's a beautiful thing, beautiful thing. Right. Josh? Yeah, so just with all that said, anybody out there, 
all the people that are listening or that watch this, I just want you to know that your life does matter. Your life does matter to the creator of this universe. The, the, the physical life that you're living matters. It matters to the people around you. It matters to the three of us that are here. It matters to the guys of uh, the greater team at Revenant Radio, that even if we don't know you, we know that there's a father out there. There's a creator out there that created your life uh, and that created you to reflect him into this world. That gr- broadly speaking, looking at all this stuff with Irenaeus and that and that all of, all of creation makes God known some way or another that you and your physical life matter because God can become known to another person because of you. And so, you know, those of you that have been living under a lie that says my life doesn't matter or, or this life doesn't matter and I just need to hang on till the end and things can be terrible right now, but eventually I'll be there, that you know what, your life does matter. And, uh, and the mm-hmm. life you live matters. And, and, you know, so I just want to bless each person watching out here who's struggling with that, mm-hmm. especially in the, in the season of life we live right now, that your life doesn't matter because God created this world for you to occupy it and for you to do the things that he's called you to do and for you to be the presence of him in this world, to you, for you to literally live sacramentally, that his grace would be on display in your life. And so I bless you to know that and to enter into that and and really to find yourself right within that tradition throughout all of Christian history that that the world matters to God and you matter to God. And so it's our pleasure to be with you uh, every week. And we've got a couple more episodes here, Back to the Fathers. We'll be back again uh, next week and keep yourself tuned to the Remnant Radio. Like, subscribe, and Tell all your friends about it and because uh, we love spending time with you guys and we love, we love being able to talk about these things. But until next week, bless you guys.